Hello, I'm Judy Reese, and you're listening to Guts Talks Double G U Double T. Thank you for listening, and make sure you subscribe, like, and leave a comment. And don't forget to watch the full episode. Thanks again for listening to Gut Talks. As you were talking, I kind of felt that it allows people to deeply understand what's in the mind of someone rather than um, assuming or having a different perception. So how do you see uh, gut feelings and clean language? Well, this is where I think clean language has got some understandings which are becoming more and more obvious. A lot of people have been reading Bessel van der Volk, um, The Body Keeps the Score in the last couple of years. And his idea around how bodies hold feelings and emotions is really, really interesting and echoes something that David Grove observed, again, probably about 20 years ago. It's a long time ago. He noticed that when people talked about their metaphors, he could ask them, whereabouts is that? And they would indicate a place in or around their bodies. People keep their thoughts and their feelings in different places. And you will often find that people keep a particularly important feeling in their gut or in their chest. Or they'll say, oh, it's, it's, in, it's in the back of my head or the front of my head or on the tip of my tongue. These phrases that sound like metaphors are literally true for people at some level. So my friend James Tripp, who is um, interested in clean language and use it his, use it, uses it in his work quite deeply, he came up with this idea of asking people what does your head know about that, whatever we've been talking about? And then what does your heart know about that? Same thing. And what does your gut know about that? And what he found was that people were confidently able to answer these questions. Pretty, you, you know, not everybody for all the time, but most people, most of the time. So for me, what's interesting there about gut feelings is you could also ask about heart feelings they will be different to head feelings and they will be different from each other heart and gut so when asked do you trust your gut judy well i will say yes sometimes and my gut feelings are amongst my feelings i have feelings all over my body um, they are of a special type, but that doesn't make them any truer, necessarily. It depends what you mean by truth. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it, it makes sense. And I'm trying to think, uh, my brain is going in different directions here, like where to can I ask you the conversation? Can, yeah. Can I ask you a question then? Yeah. What does your gut know about what I just said? My gut? I don't think much if not nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what does your heart know about what I just said? It's difficult. I, I, I think I need time to be able to differentiate mm. how uh, my gut feelings and my heart feelings. Uh, mm. Yeah. And that, that's not uncommon, that mm. actually, for a lot of people, it takes more time to connect with the feelings that are in their body. Mm -hmm. and with the thoughts that are in their head. And this is something that um, has been observed in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, mm -hmm. you've probably come mm -hmm. across that over the years. And there's, a, there's an approach called MBIT, which is a, a der derivative, deriv I can't say the word, derivative, derivative of NLP, <laughs> um, which focuses on this idea of um, feelings being in the body. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's commonly reported that people take longer to get in touch with their body feelings than with their head thoughts and also to differentiate them from each other. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I tend to mix now that you're talking. I'm trying to reflect, but I need to keep my attention here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, go into a deep self-reflection. Um, that for me, when I kind of, and this is actually what I say in my first episode with, it, with myself for like six minutes when I explain why I started this podcast and so on, is for me, when I started, I'm not going to say always trusting, but at least listening to my gut, um, things kind of changed because I started also making decisions based on my gut and not just on you know my brain, my head, um, and some kind of rationality. Um, and this did make a difference for me, and and I still do this, but now I, now I have to figure out the, the hard feelings. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but I try to keep also me as a person in general to keep like feelings kind of separate. Um, to to what I, I try to do so but that one I know but maybe I should integrate it and try mm. at least try because I'm usually an advocate of trying things <laughs> and thinking I find, so. I'm, I'm really curious about that because for me I, I find it really difficult to um, to make decisions without really being in touch with my body feelings if I'm studying something new or want to write something create something I need to walk Mm -hmm. to get my thoughts to sort themselves out mm -hmm. um and i've been re reading a really interesting book may i recommend a book um sure. it's called move by caroline williams and it's all about the um, cognitive effects of um movement and including walking and breathing and exercise and yoga and all those kind of things it's it's a, a compilation of all the latest research on how the body affects thinking and of course feeling um thinking includes feeling for her and for a whole bunch of other authors uh because we're not disembodied brains in jars we are whole human beings it, it takes me back to design school in that sense as you're talking because we have like uh, the 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 mind the heart and the hand right the arm mm. that makes us do things create stuff uh the, even draw whatever get what's here and here like okay for the audio lessons what's in the brain and the heart out there and visualize that and make mm. it kind of tangible and it, it's it's just taking me back to well <laughs> 15 years ago or so uh what you're talking about here but you know i was very tempted to do this episode using clean language but then i was like no i'm not gonna do this <laughs> well, it'll be a really good exercise but uh, i want to make the most of you here uh, <laughs> In, interviewing people using clean language is a mixed um blessing when i use clean language in interviews I need to make sure that the framing is really, really clear to everybody. And I will never only use clean language if I'm interviewing somebody, whether that's a recruitment interview, a research interview, an interview for a podcast. I used to have a podcast as well. Um, I'm, I, oh, you might check that out on YouTube. There's a whole bunch of Collaboration Dynamics podcasts in which I'm primarily using clean language questions to interview my podcast interviewees. What's interesting about that is, of course, I do ask them about their metaphors. I ask them about their um, where their feelings are, all those kind of things, which is great fun. But I won't typically only use clean language questions in those interviews because it's not just about hearing the stream of consciousness from the interviewee. It's also about, well, what do my listeners want to hear from this person? You, as the interviewer, you're representing the listeners. You've got your own agenda. It's not just about free form, them talking. And it's not the same as coaching somebody use, using clean language, where the clean language coach seeks to reduce their presence in the coaching session as far as possible, so that the coach E takes center stage, determines the agenda, works out, you know, what's important, where we should end up. And the clean language questions then provide a structured process to get them there. Mm 